in a fairly steady, unbroken succession of conservative governments. You cannot say, well, Labour government, Labour governments come, Labour governments go, but the Conservative Party carries on and the main traditions and customs and institutions of English life will continue and recover. That is not the case. We are facing a class enemy which is explicitly dedicated to the destruction of everything that we recognize in England and which wants to replace everything that we have ever known about England with something new and sinister and fundamentally alien. What do I mean by ruling class? Well, I don't mean the capitalists in their top hats and their black suits. I don't mean the lords in their coronets and their ermine robes and their coaches driving quickly through London with their mackies running before them. When I talk about a ruling class, I mean those politicians, bureaucrats, lawyers, educators, media people, and associated business interests who derive income, status, and power from the activities of an expanded state. That is what I mean by the ruling class. You might well say, what's new? It has always been so. We have always had a ruling class like this. We have always had an establishment. Yes, that is true. But the establishment has never been so united as it is now. The establishment has never been so undiverse. It has never been so dedicated to a single project as the ruling class is today. And what is that ruling class dedicated to? As I said, it is dedicated to the subversion of everything that we have ever thought our country was about. It is dedicated to the replacement of England with something else. Let's see how it operates. The ruling class or the establishment, call it what you will, has always dominated the national life of a country. The ruling class always has had a dominant ideology. It, it enforces this through a series of uh, through a series of institutions and practices. There are the churches, there are the schools, the universities, the media, there are the published statements of politicians. There are all sorts of formal and informal mechanisms by which the ruling ideology is propagated. Now that has always been so, and there's nothing controversial about that. But um, this particular ruling class is absolutely obsessed with the imposition of a particular ideology or particular set of ideologies. And the various means of propagation have been sharpened, and they are now utterly committed to a single ideology or a single group of ideologies. There is, of course, the European project the idea of destroying our national independence and merging us into a United States of Europe. I don't need to say too much about that because I'm sure most of you are very good Eurosceptics and you know the nature of that threat. There is also the war on terror, which in my opinion, and you may well disagree, which in my opinion is something which our own government has gratuitously inflicted on we had absolutely no reason to get involved in this lunatic American-led war in the Middle East. It has brought endless trouble on us, and the government is using a set of crises of its own making to turn the country into a police state. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, not, do not suppose that the anti-terrorist legislation passed by this government is seriously intended for use against people with big beards and funny robes who run around with Semtex waistcoats. The purpose of these laws is to control you, 
And we saw that last week, that 82-year-old Labour Party member who raised a whisper of protest against a government minister's speech, jumped on by some people who looked like uh, nightclub bouncers, thrown into the street and arrested under the terrorism laws when he tried to re-enter. Look at the um, fuel protests. Five years ago, they carried all before them for a whole week, paralyzed the whole country. Uh, this time, they tried to repeat the exercise, and the ringleaders were taken very quietly aside by government lawyers who explained to them the precise meaning of the Civil Contingencies Act. The government or a minister can declare a state of emergency for any reason he sees fit, and once there is a state of emergency, the authorities can confiscate businesses and confiscate homes and destroy anyone they like with no legal redress. These people were taken aside and they were shown these powers. And then they were told, you have a democratic right to protest, you have a democratic right to withdraw your labour. But if you do that, we will destroy you. Rather like the Inquisition, the old days, with Galileo. But they didn't torture Galileo, no. They took him around the torture chamber and explained the uses of the various racks and whips and hooked, and hooked, whip, uh, sorry, and hooked gloves. And at the end of that, not a finger laid on him, he signed the retraction. Much the same was done last month to the fuel protesters. They didn't know it hit them. Such is life in Tony Blair's New Britain. And then there is the multicultural project, which overrides and in a sense encompasses all else. This is sold to us as tolerance. Tolerance of other people's religions, tolerance of other people's lifestyles. And for myself, I have no objection to that. It is not my concern what religion people follow. It is not my concern if people follow no religion at all. It is not my concern what language people talk at home or what clothes people wear at home. It is not really my concern what clothes people choose to wear in the street. But multiculturalism is much more than an agenda of persuading us to live and let live. It is an ideology which justifies the smashing of our own way of life and its replacement with something or a set of other things which are not at all congenial and not at all tolerant. Let's give some examples. There was a story in today's Daily Mail always a good place to find information. Story in today's Daily Mail. Um, the prison warders in a particular institution have been told to stop wearing badges which have a cross on them because it might cause offence to the Muslim prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> Manchester City Council some years ago stopped um, celebrating Christmas. It now refers to, the, to winter, the festival of winter. There is apparently a council in the Midlands which has banned any card or representation on council property of a pig, which means that you no longer have the three little pigs um, read out in the classroom, because it might cause offence to Muslims. Several hotels and several hotels have stopped stocking the Gideon Bible. National Health Service Hospital no longer quite often have a Bible placed by the sides of patients' beds on the grounds that it might give offence. Now I've spoken to Muslims, I spend a lot of my time working with Muslims, and they keep on insisting to me that they're not interested in this. They do not want to stop people from being Christians. They do not want to stop English people from being English. Indeed, indeed, many of them would dearly love to be accepted as English, but, but that's not important. This is not something led by Muslims, it's not something necessarily led by black people. This is something imposed on us by the elite. We must not simply tolerate the newcomers, we must make way for them. The newcomers are positively encouraged not to integrate. They are encouraged to keep their own ways of life, no matter how illiberal these might be. And um, instead of just saying, oh, 
bugging dark. He's like, come to this country, expect everything to be done for them. No, that isn't the case. No. Most of them came here as an act of positive choice because they wanted to live in a free country. Well, they don't have any choice. What we now have is state-enforced organization. Balkanization. You know, if, no, not if, we're far too late for it. When the multicultural project finally succeeds, democracy in this country will become impossible. Free speech will become impossible. Freedom of association will become impossible. We are fast approaching a situation where elections are absolutely meaningless. There are already places in this country where there is no point in having council elections. The reason being that you might as well, you might as well fill up the uh, vacancies on the council simply by looking at the latest set of census returns because uh, people of Pakistani Muslim origin vote for their own, people of Indian Hindu origin vote for their own, people of West Indian black origin vote for their own, and presumably English people may be allowed to vote for their own. There, there is no point having a democratic debate because nobody changes his mind. There is no longer in part of the country the circumstances under which you can have a proper democratic election because there is no such thing as a single public opinion. A single public opinion where people read much the same newspapers, watch much the same television programs, and um, are open to the same persuasive arguments. What you now have is a fragmented electorate. They read their own publications, and there is no point in trying to argue, because you may argue in English, or in Urdu, or in Hindi, or in some other language. It doesn't matter. You are addressing a fragmented audience, and you cannot expect to run a democratic system in the way that Democrats have been talking about in this country for centuries. We are fast approaching a situation where you cannot have trial by jury, because if the jury is made up of people of one, uh, if, people, sorry, if the jury is made up of people from one uh, community, let's call it, they will convict or acquit simply on the basis of the origin of the defendant. We are approaching a situation in which we have a ruling class, which is an elite cut off from the rest of the country. And its function will be to preserve order among a balkanized, fragmented population. We are moving towards a situation in which we are not a nation, we are a community of communities. And then it will be necessary to have a cosmopolitan elite which is not beholden to any single one of the communities that make up this nation, they will be needed to float freely above any sexual interest and to keep the peace. That is what we're moving towards and that is what these people want. Now how does the elite or the ruling class or the establishment impose these various ideologies on us? Not in the way that the Nazis and the Soviets imposed their ideologies with crude obvious propaganda. You don't have two-minute hate on television. Uh, you don't have martial music played when Princess Tony decides to address the nation. No, no. We have all the appearance of a liberal democratic order still about us. The propaganda is much more subtle. The news programs, for example, are not obviously biased. They do not say things like, and today our wonderful Prime Minister Tony Blair spoke with school children and here is ten minutes of him speaking with them, and the evil fascist opposition party was saying this and we won't report in full. 
They don't do that. It's not Soviet style propaganda. The propaganda in most of the newspapers and on all of the electronic media is much more sophisticated than that. It is a question of which stories are reported, what facts are reported in stories. And even when a story is reported apparently quite straight, it is a question of what precedes that report and what follows it. Let me give you an example of how the media operates to impose some hegemonic ideology on us. A couple of months ago, there were two murders within 24 hours of each other. A black boy was murdered in Liverpool. He was immediately dubbed an A-level student and was canonized in much the same way as Stephen Lawrence. He was given a funeral service in Liverpool Cathedral of the kind that is normally reserved for minor royalty. In the same day, a man called Richard Wellen was murdered in the Holloway Road. Uh, somebody was throwing chips at his girlfriend, he set up to test and was uh, hacked to death by a person. We learned incidentally what the colour was of this person who hacked him to death. Uh, this was not a racist murder, it was not reported as such, and it was soon it soon dropped out of the newspaper reports and the television reports. That is the way in which the hegemonic ideology is imposed on us. We are told that in this country, white people are incurably racist, and black people must be protected by law from these evil white racists. And so every time a black person is killed by a white person, it becomes a racist murder, a cause celeb in the media. On the rather more frequent occasions where a white person is murdered by black people, it's simply something that slides through the media, leaving no trace behind. That is how the news media manages to impose this hegemonic ideology. It doesn't necessarily tell lies, it just chooses to report certain stories and not to report certain stories, to play up certain stories and to downplay certain stories. You then have the discussion programs. I should know about this because I've taken part in any number of the things. Uh, sometimes you turn on question time, and you might as well be watching. Uh, you might as well be watching a discussion program from a foreign country. The audience is asking questions about things which do not really interest you. They're not asking questions about things which do interest you. The panel is putting points of view, and often arguing quite vigorously for and against points of view, which you do not regard as at all important. What you regard as the important issues are not discussed in the media. That is another way in which the hegemonic ideology is imposed on. And then, much more important than current affairs programs and current affairs discussions, you have the entertainment media. Everything is political where the entertainment media is concerned. You cannot switch off after watching any entertainment program and say, oh, it was only a television program, it doesn't mean anything. It does mean something. As I said, everything is political. Uh, Chris, Dr. Tame and I are at the moment writing a long analysis of an episode of a program called Spooks, which was shown a few weeks ago on television. Spooks is about a it's about an elite group within British intelligence which is charged with the job of upholding democracy within this country. A few weeks ago this uh, little unit was given the job of disrupting a party called the British Way, which is based on a party uh, not a million miles from the British National Party. Now, what this program was about was the disruption by the security services of a legal political party which was offering candidates for election. Now when I, was, when I was a boy, the idea that the security services would openly break up 
a political party were unthinkable. If I had said, if someone had told me 25 years ago, the state is deliberately smashing up opposition parties, and I said, no, 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 you can't do that. This is Britain. It's a free country. You can say anything you like, and you can stand for office. Uh, well, no, you can't. We know that that's the case. And this program was softening us up for the disruption of the BNP. It was a very cleverly done program. You had the leader of the party, who looks and sounds rather like Nick Griffin. Um, for some reason, I don't fully understand, there is a Conservative MP who has defected to the British way. This person looks and sounds a bit like Robert Kilroy still, and a bit like somebody else whom we've not yet been able to identify. The Nick Griffin-style character comes out with statements which sound really Griffinish and which have a considerable resonance among parts of the indigenous population. But every statement made by this Nick Griffin-style character is intercut with scenes of skinheads, white skinheads beating up black people, ethnic cleansing on council estates. These apparently quite reasonable statements are continually juxtaposed beside scenes of extreme violence. We are told the subtext of this program is it doesn't matter that these people put on suits, it doesn't matter that they may occasionally sound reasonable, this is a gangster party. These are seriously bad people and it is only right and proper for security services to intervene <coughs> and to break these people up. That is the intention of this program. And there is no point telling me, but sure, it was just a television play. No, it wasn't. It was propaganda. Everything is propaganda that you see on the television. If you look at EastEnders, which I try not to watch very often, that also is political. It is propaganda. What EastEnders does is to portray a world which in its outward it, which in its outward appearance looks very like the world that we inhabit. Street markets, pubs, um, much the same decor as working class houses. But there is something about it which is not like our world. It is a parallel world, a fantasy world. But we are expected by the continual viewing of this program to conform ourselves to conform ourselves to the mores of this artificial world. And what are the mores of this artificial world? Well, a couple of years ago, there was a plot line. As I, said, I don't watch this terribly often, so you may be able to come up with something more current. There was a plot line in which the daughter of an East London taxi driver began going out with a black doctor. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if, if someone wants to go out with somebody of another race, it's not my business. It's not my business to tell people whom they should sleep with or whom they should marry. But I can tell you, I can tell you, and you can tell me, that white East End taxi drivers will not, on the whole, take very kindly to the fact that their daughter is going out with a black man, even with a doctor. Did the family object to these standards? Yes, it did object, on the grounds that he was a bit older than her. <laughs> you can laugh. But the subtext of this program, again, was the delegitimization of a certain line of thought. People do not stand up in these standards and make speeches to camera about how wicked racism is, or how wicked it is to wave the Union flag, or how certain things should be done and should not be done. As I said, the propaganda is not that crude. What you have instead is the selection of storylines which by continual iteration and reiteration are intended to reconfigure the ways in which ordinary people think. You have the you have the positive agenda of propagation, you also have the negative agenda of propagation. Some, about 20 years ago, Benny Hill disappeared from the airways. I assumed that he'd got old and retired, or he'd gone out of fashion. But no, no, Benny Hill 
was and is wildly popular in the United States and in Eastern Europe. When I first turned up in Czechoslovakia 15 years ago, I turned on the television and there was Benny Hill dubbed into Czech, into Hungarian and into German. Benny Hill was and is wildly popular in much of continental Europe and in the United States. He was dropped deliberately from the British television schedules because his kind of humour was not political in the right way. Do you remember a soap opera called Crossroads? Yes, I had fond memories of that. Um, if ever you see clips from Crossroads shown on television, we're told, oh, Crossroads, it was so down market, its production values were so cheap, what a good thing it was killed. Well, perhaps, but when it was killed, Crossroads was still pulling in an audience uh, in the millions. It was a wildly popular soap opera. Why was it killed? The answer is because it was a fundamentally conservative soap opera. It was the, the central character of Crossroads was a character called Nick Richardson, the owner of a motel, who was always facing problems, problems sometimes caused by the state authorities. And the, the resolution of those problems was always that she overcame them. She would often come out with statements like, prevarication is the thief of time. She was rather like a character from an Ayn Rand novel. Crossroads had to be destroyed. It was sending out the wrong message to people. The Doily Cart Opera Company was killed about 20 years ago by the Arts Council of England. All right, in the late 70s, I used to go to Doily Cart Opera Company performances at Gilded and Sullivan. And their production values were not that good. It was uh, <coughs> rather faded. But, uh, well, I'm sorry, the Arts Council of England uh, was financing all sorts of absolutely dreadful things. Piles of bricks in the Tate Gallery. Um, you name it, they were financing it. What was wrong with Gilbert and Sullivan? The answer is that they did not, that they were off message. They did not help to propagate the dominant ideology. Popular entertainment is political. The next time you watch anything on television, EastEnders, Brookside, oh no, Brookside's gone, shows me how often I watch this stuff, Spooks, The Bill, Prime Suspect, Taggart, you Casualty. name it. Pardon? Casualty is the next time you turn on the television and you watch any of these soaps or drama programs, just video it, and then watch it again and again and look for the political message because there will always be a political message in these things and the political message is that people like you are weird. People like you are not normal. The, the, the intention of these programs is to delegitimize our way of thinking. The characters these senders, as I said, do not stand up and say to camera, you should never vote to conservative you should vote for that nice Mr. Blair. But what they do by their storylines and their dialogues is to make the idea of voting conservative, and I mean voting really conservative, as bizarre as wanting to join a Carmelite monster, a Carmelite nun. I now come to the class issue. <coughs> I said earlier that there is no such thing as wasteful government spending. Well, if you look at the newspapers, there is a lot of wasteful government spending. Here is the front page of the Times from Monday, September 26th. State spending on private consultants has soared to 2.5 billion pounds. And we're told, you know, look how labor is wasting our money. A few years ago, the Adam Smith Institute published um, a very interesting and very important um, little book in, in which some of Madsen Peary's researchers had gone through the Society Guardian, working out how much all of these jobs were costing the taxpayer. And we were told, look, look, look how much the government is spending of our money on people who are walking outreach coordinators and AIDS educational advisors. And the like. Well, this is wasteful government spending if you assume that the purpose nowadays of government spending is to provide common services. 
Uh, let me tell you, the purpose of government spending is to provide jobs for the ruling class and its various clients. This £2.5 billion pounds spent on private advisors is not wasted money well spent, because what it does is to provide jobs, power, status, income, call it what you, do, what you will, it provides jobs for people who believe the right things and who will propagate the right things. That is the purpose of all these AIDS education officers, walking outreach coordinators, um, health and safety officers. It doesn't, matter what, it doesn't matter what they're called. It doesn't matter what they do. Their function is to exist. Now, you can call the civil service and local authorities a gigantic system of jobbery, a vast network of jobs for the ruling class and the various hangers-on of the ruling class. And you can still try to contrast this with private business. Private interests, private business is so uncorrupt. Private business is really on our side. And I can tell you, no, it isn't. Private business is not on our side. A few weeks ago, I found a copy of this magazine, Public Affairs. It was an idol. It, it revealed to me an entire side to this system of jobbery, which I had never really thought about before. Let me read you a few things from, the, from this Public Affairs. Darren Murphy, the former Special Advisor for Prime Minister, is to join ATCO, um, a public relations company, as a director in its London office. Murphy worked at number 10 for over three years as assistant political secretary and then special advisor to Tony Blair, responsible for all strategic political communications and media issues. Prior to that, he served for four years as special advisor to the health secretary, advising all elements of health policy nationally and internationally, blah, blah, blah. This man must be on 90,000, 150,000 a year. Nice if you can get it. But let me uh, turn away from the big headline stuff. Let me turn to the advertisements, the job advertisements, the appointments. These two. Forward-thinking charity, i.e. shelter. A leading social care organisation seeks high energy initiatives with a track record in relationship building, bobbing and campaigning. Uh, ignore the next paragraph, it's the usual corporate walking. An extensive knowledge of the political system and parliamentary procedures required, as is experience of managing relationships with politicians and civil servants. Called Public Affairs Officer, £33,000 a year plus benefits. Nice if you can get it, isn't it? And who gets this kind of job? A young Person. Imagine you're 18. You go off to study at uh, Durham University or London Metropolitan University or wherever. You uh, suck up to the right lecturer. When you've taken your degree, he gives you an introduction to a Labour MP. You go off and become his research. Uh, you become his researcher for a few years. You're paid a pittance, but you make all sorts of useful contacts and you get a good inside knowledge of how the system works. When you're 25, you stop working for your Labour MP and you apply for this job, the Public Affairs Officer, £33,000 £33, plus benefits. Nice if you can get it. 25 years old, £33,000 a year. Just up your street, isn't it? After a few years of doing this, you then move on to become the Public Affairs Manager for a leading household brand. £45,000 a year, plus car, plus benefits. A diverse challenge calling for an effective lobbyist, comfortable working with business unit heads, government officials, and parliamentarians in the UK and the EU. A minimum of three years public affairs experience, including a thorough understanding of Westminster and Whitehall is essential. Ideally, with some commercial exposure, you can, demonst sorry, you can demonstrate resourcefulness and creativity in developing initiatives once you've done your three years of shelter, you move on to become the public affairs manager for um, a private company. 
You might then move back into government and do a couple of years working in the number 10 policy unit, or you might advise the Home Office on some aspects of privatising the prisons. You, back, you move back and forth, charities, government... Then you stand for Parliament. Then you stand for Parliament, but you don't need to. You don't need to stand for Parliament. You can go on to get £150,000 a year, putting on a suit and becoming a corporate apparatchik. Now, when you eventually become the public affairs manager of a company like um, Procter & Gamble, let's say, you don't go native. What you do is you corrupt formerly private business. Because your job is to advise your company on how to live within the framework of government regulation. You will go to your you will go to the reps and say, look, I know I know John Smith, who is the Minister of Diversity Affairs, and I think what I can do is I can do a dispensation for you. But in return for that, you'll have to run these kind of policies. Now that means that you have a certain control over the kind of people who are selected as senior managers within that company. And of course, the kind of people you recommend for senior management positions are your people. And so, formally private business becomes part of the ideological state apparatus. What you have is the formation of a bureaucratic corporate elite. It doesn't matter if you work for a it doesn't matter if you work for a multinational corporation, it doesn't matter if you work directly for the government, it doesn't matter if you're a formerly private consultant. What you have is a ruling class standing above us which straddles all positions of importance. As I said, politicians, bureaucrats, lawyers, educators, churchmen, don't forget the churches are now being co-opted media and formerly private business. These people are the ruling class. And, well, that explains why I'm addressing the kind of meeting that I'm addressing, doesn't it? The average age in this room is probably over 40. Most of you are not in high-paying jobs. No one has exceptions. Most of you do not earn a large amount of money. Now, that is our movement. That is the history of our movement over the last 25 years. Where are the support networks for our movement? Where are the well-paid, cushy jobs for young people who come into our movement? I don't do badly. I have no complaints. I make a lot of money from teaching and consultancy. But when I'm a teacher and consultant, I am not a libertarian conservative. I'm a teacher and consultant. Those things are kept separate. I can see that one person in this room is a journalist, quite a well-paid journalist. He's not a libertarian journalist. He's a journalist who in his spare time is a libertarian. It doesn't matter what sort of job you have. I see a lawyer here. Not quite, a, not, not quite one of us, but near enough. He's a lawyer. He's not a lawyer who manages to integrate his political views into the job he does. If you want to live, breathe, if you want to live, eat and breathe politics, you don't work. If you want to work, you keep your political opinions largely to yourself, or you tell people what they are, but do not push them. Because in your, uh, in your occupation, you are paid to do a certain job which should not involve being a libertarian or a conservative. If, on the other hand, you are one of the enemy class, the ruling class, you've got this. You can live, eat, and breathe your lefty politics every day of the day, every minute of the day and night. And uh, let me say this. All of the money for this gigantic class of parasites comes out of our pockets. But it's not like water coming out of a hose pipe in a single jet. It's like water coming out of a shower head. Thousands and thousands of individual streams. It may be that you will start off your career, if you're so inclined, working for the Commission for Racial Equality. You then find that you're a line manager who's the complete kid who hates you and you hate him. And so you step sideways and go to work for the charity commission. 
or you go to the work um, as a public affairs, as a public affairs officer for uh, Unilever or for British Petroleum. You move around, you find your niche. All of your money comes ultimately out of the taxpayer's pocket, but the money is so the money is so split and refracted that there are so many different streams and you can find your own position. If on the other hand you're stupid enough to choose our side of the political debate, well, you may be lucky. You may get a job working for a supposedly right-wing institution, a policy institute. And how many policy institutes are there on our side? How many? Half a dozen? Ten? No, let's say with half a dozen. What happens if there you find that the main funder of this is a sadistic bully who embezzles your national insurance contribution? Perhaps I should uh, cut this out in the final. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Well, there's nowhere else to move because nobody else will employ you, so you have to grin and bear it. What happens if your boss comes to you and says, well, of course you can keep your job, but you must, of course, do um, out-of-hours favours for me. Perhaps I'll cut this out as well. But the answer is you choose the doll, or you choose some dreadful job which is nothing connected with what you believe, or you, um, or you think of England. But in most cases, you just don't get those jobs because there is no money by our side. And such money as there is, is handed out by a few rich people who, quite frankly, are the means yet. But uh, there's no point insulting these people. I'm glad that someone's handing out a bit of money here and there. But uh, there is no career structure for people on our side. There's no money in our movement. And that's why there are so few of us. And that's why, to be perfectly blunt, most of us are a bit odd. And I'm not saying you are old, I'm saying we are old. We are all of us eccentric in various ways. And the reason is because nobody becomes one of us unless he's a bit strange. Because there's no money in it, there's no career progression, there's no network of support. And so the idea that we can win by putting our arguments is a non-starter. It doesn't matter that we're in the right on many issues. It doesn't matter that we're on the right on all issues. Truth is unimportant in the short term. We are facing a gigantically expanded ruling class, which lives at our expense, but which controls every single institution of public life, and which, is, which may disagree on a number of marginal issues, the Iraq War, for example, but which is absolutely agreed that people like us and our ideas should never be allowed again to raise their heads seriously in this country. Now, what are we going to do about that? And my answer is nothing. We've lost. We've lost. In 25 years' time, many of us will be dead. And there won't be many people after us. We are the last generation of people on our side. And that's it. We go down fighting. I'm not saying that we should just creep away and dig our gardens. But I'm also telling you quite bluntly that we have lost. Unless there is some unexpected turn of events, those people have won. We are the last generation of people. And the reason they tolerate us is because they know that we are history. They don't need to disrupt us in the way they need to disrupt the British National Party because there won't be that many left in a few decades. So, enjoy it while it lasts. And if you want, if you want to read more about this whole matter of the cultural revolution that we face in this country and how we might perhaps win it, here is a copy of a book of which I will sell for the derisory sum of £10. I normally sell them for £18.99 on Amazon, and I've got some left, so you can have them at this point. But that's all I have to say. I'm sure many people stand up and say, no, no, it's nonsense, but that's up to you. Thank you.
well for a talk that was uh, not a single note to be seen, and absolutely miraculous and wonderful. Um, I think it's a really tour de force. Do you not think possibly that um, the upsurge of a, uh, a Chinese um, a sort of pseudo-democracy might in fact so destroy this country that this elite may get to us? Uh, Dr. Tainley here to answer that one. Um, well, I think the chances that China will collapse anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> China will collapse? Yes. Um, um, I think the answer is, is no. Um, I don't see why um, um, increased competition from overseas would necessarily lead to the collapse of the domestic ruling class. It will respond in one way or another to such challenges. It may respond successfully or unsuccessfully, but I don't see any threat to its power from the, simply the rise of another hegemonic power overseas. I mean, the English ruling class, you know, after all, lost an empire, they lost world hegemony to the United States. It didn't put an end to the British ruling class. I don't see why an end to American hegemony and the rise of China to hegemony will necessarily put an end to the British ruling class. Robert Sorry, Rob Henderson. Um, a couple of quick comments and then uh, something approaching a question. It might just have the construction to it. Um, the first thing I'd say to you is that elites only have one principle, that is they'll do anything to maintain their power and privilege. So it's quite conceivable as it happened in 1931, and suddenly we went from being free trade for 80 years to being protectionist. So it's quite possible there could be some dramatic event which would uh, uh, turn them around. I mean, they're already getting the wind up a little bit on the question of how dangerous are the Muslim minority in the country. Uh, whether that will actually come to anything, we'll have to wait and see, but it's quite conceivable that they do. The second point is that it isn't just a, a, a UK problem, this is an international class which is being actually created. That's, uh, that's the second point. And the third point, and this is really where it comes down to the question. Now, you've left out one big thing, and you probably have to guess what it is before I actually mention it, which is economics. Now, you can't have national sovereignty and you, with free trade. And of course, that's the big problem for libertarians. They want to have the free trade want to have the national sovereignty. The two are utterly incompatible, particularly when they're linked to mass immigration. We were told constantly that part of the free trade deal is that you've got to have free movement of people as well, which of course is uh, intellectual nonsense, but nonetheless, that's how it's actually sold. So, my, my, my question to you, Sean, is quite simple. As a libertarian, how are you actually going to square that circle of being, um, on the one hand, uh, a free trader, and on the other hand, wanting to take away that which is giving power to this new elite, and uh, namely, uh, you know, the internationalism of which free trade and mass immigration are, in fact, the two underlying pegs. Okay. Uh, Robert, I have a great deal of respect for your writings. Um, I, I think you're one of the best writers in our movement. And when you write about political matters and social matters, I often think, you know, I wish I'd said that myself. However, I'm afraid you know nothing about economics. Now, you may say that you know enough about them, but you know nothing about economics. And there is no conflict between having national sovereignty in this country and having free trade. And there is no necessary connection between free trade and free migration. I disagree with you fundamentally on that. As I said, I have a great deal of respect for everything you write until you mention economics. It's the balkanisation of the country is due to the mass immigration. It's the way it's sold, though, isn't it? But I haven't, I haven't disputed that with you, Robert. I just don't agree with you on economics. At 5 o'clock this morning, I downloaded and printed 24 pages of your critique of market economics. And I don't agree with it. But let's not get into an argument. Let's not get into a dogfight over that. We agree on many issues. Let's focus on the points of agreement. Barry, 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 then you are going to the Barry, Barry first. I agree with practically everything that Sean has said. But he seems to me to have done what he was accusing the media of doing namely running some stories and entirely neglecting other stories. And also, as an extreme example, he cited the fate of the Carmelites and uh, the way in which we, and those of our persuasion, 
might be mocked for going in the same direction as those unfortunate nuns. Well, as it happened, I was last night at a performance of the Carmelites by Poulon. And it's an opera I've seen before, and I find it very impressive. It's also good to see something on stage uh, which represents our point of view, I might say. The house was packed, and so I have every hope and expectation that it will sell well uh, for the rest of the season. Um, what I missed in your exposition, Sean, was uh, any place allowed for the forces of competition. No ruling class or elite is as powerful or as long-lasting as uh, you were implying. Um, I suspect that uh, Keats Ozymandias is a fictional example, but uh, nevertheless, he's quite a pithy one. Remember what happened to him. And with any luck, uh, the same thing might happen to some of these you've been criticizing. The forces of competition, although we don't see much of them in certain places, are in some ways more powerful than they have ever been in the media. If you go into a, a bookseller, uh, or a news agent in particular, there are enormous numbers of magazines all around the world, not all of which are non-political. And it is difficult for uh, a prime minister like Blair, however skillful, to uh, infiltrate all these different uh, uh, means of communication. And uh, um, I admit to being a technophobe, but uh, my friends who are up in these things tell me that uh, uh, it's more difficult now than it ever was to suppress ideas because of the, the power of the internet. So would you care to comment on any of these, uh, uh, I hope, um, polite and uh, well-meant reposts? Of course. Um, interesting essay written about 40 years ago by Herbert Marcuse on repressive tolerance, which applies very well to the way in which our rules are legally made. No opinion is formally prescribed in this country. You can read anything you like. If you want to read about uh, Holocaust revisionism, you take an extreme example, you can. There are no laws against downloading and reading any of this stuff. But um, when a ruling elite controls the electronic media and most of the newspapers in one way or another, this can be marginalised. And perhaps in the long term, as with the growth of um, disbelief in the 18th century, eventually the ruling elite and its paradigm will collapse. In, in the long run, these people can indeed say, my name is Ozymandias, as king of kings, look on my works, you mighty, and despair. You may eventually see the broken statues of these people lying half buried in the desert sand, but it can take hundreds and hundreds of years before the sand covers the moon. And I'm afraid we don't have hundreds of years. Mm. So, Jeff, yeah. Sean.